I want to introduce you to two researchers. Their names are Carmen Reinhart and Kenneth Rogoff. And in recent history, these two have been considered to have written the seminal paper on economic austerity policy. And the idea behind their paper is that for countries with high debt, those countries' governments should spend less money during an economic recession to recover better from that recession. And this idea was widely adopted around the world, a little bit in the United States, more predominantly in countries across Europe. But the problem is that this paper is wrong. And it came out that it's wrong because of this gentleman. He's named Thomas Herndon, and he was an economics grad student. So he had a classroom assignment to go out and reproduce a published article. And he picked the Reinhardt and Rogoff article. And he took the article, he gathered a bunch of publicly available data, and set about reproducing the results. But he couldn't make the results work out, and he got more and more frustrated, and finally he just contacted the authors and said, help me. The authors were very nice, and they sent Herndon their data. And that's where the real problem started, because Herndon opened up that spreadsheet and he found errors. He found data points that had been thrown out that shouldn't have been. He found mistakes in calculations. And when he corrected those errors, he found that austerity was not actually proven by the data. So here we have a policy and a paper that's been hugely influential around the world. In the United States, it was estimated in 2012 from the Congressional Budget Office that if we had enacted austerity instead of stimulus, that is, less spending instead of more spending, we would have had 1% higher unemployment, and instead of a projected 1.7% economic growth, we would have had an economic decline of 0.5%. And you only have to look at Greece to see how damaging these policies can be. Greece has enacted wide austerity measures, received multiple expensive bailouts, has had a lot of political unrest, and their unemployment rate is about 25%. But this talk is not about economic austerity. This talk is about something more important. This talk is about the unusual thing that Reinhardt and Rogoff did, and that's that they shared their data. And I want to tell you a little bit about research today and why that's so important that people should share their data and should start doing that more. And to understand how research works, a researcher gets an idea, and they go out and get funding for a project. They do the project, they come up with something interesting, and they write it up as an article. And the article gets published, but the data that go along with the article, the data that tell an important story, that gets pushed to the side, that gets forgotten, that gets trashed. And that's a problem. And this problem is best summed up by two researchers named Buck Height and Don Ho. And they say that a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself. It is merely advertising of the scholarship. We're only getting a polished version of the story. We're not getting the data. We're not getting the full version of the story. And that's a problem. To put this in context, we spend $130 billion every year in the United States to publicly fund research. And this research is critical. This leads to really important innovations and really important technologies. So for example, if you go to your doctor's office and your doctor says, we need to get a picture of your head to diagnose your condition, you can go get an MRI because an MRI was partially developed with public funding. And we need to keep funding that research, but we need to do that in a more transparent way. So <laughs> there's a saying in pop culture that goes, pictures or it didn't happen. So if I go out and I'm having a night in the town and oh my gosh, it's Bill Murray, that's amazing, I met Bill Murray, uh, my friends are not gonna believe it until I have some sort of photographic proof. So I'm saying that we should adapt and adopt this expression for research and say data or it didn't happen. So if you're telling me that you found the cure for cancer, I kind of want to see your data to know how strong that claim is. And we need to get in a system where we say data or didn't happen because an article, an advertising alone, is not telling us enough and it's leading to several problems. The first is a problem of reproducibility, that idea that you can take an article, go out and do exactly what that researcher did, and get the same or similar results. And a study of cancer researchers found that over half of them, 55% of them, have had trouble at one point in time reproducing the results from a published article. To put this in context of money, in preclinical research, it's estimated we're wasting $30 billion a year on irreproducible research. And that's research that's supposed to go into your doctor's office and into the hospital and it doesn't stand up to repeated testing. That's a problem. The second problem with this system is it lets fraud creep in. And one of the best examples of this, or the worst examples, comes from a guy named Dietrich Stapel. And here he is profiled in the New York Times Magazine. And Stapel was a very prominent researcher in psychology and he studied the idea of priming. 
and that was that you could unconsciously introduce a topic to somebody and have it affect the way be, that, be, that they behave. So he was widely respected until it came out that he had been making up most all of his data. And this really shook the whole field of psychology to its roots, and they realized if one of our prominent researchers can publish so widely on totally made up data, maybe we have a problem. Maybe we're letting other kinds of errors slip into our articles. Depel, by the way, has the distinction of being number four on the Retraction Watch leaderboard list. If you like uh, scholarly publications, if you're all interested, this blog is amazing because they go through and they track whenever an article is retracted. And basically that means we no longer have faith in the results of that study. And there's all sorts of crazy reasons why articles get retracted. But one of the other things they do is they keep a leaderboard list of the number of articles that certain people have retracted by count. So Dietrich Stapel, he's at 54 articles retracted. He's not at the top, actually. At the top is Yoshitaki Fuji, 183. And you can't tell me that we don't have a problem with this system when someone can publish 183 papers on suspect data and no one caught them. Stapel, by the way, uh, lost his job and voluntarily gave up his PhD to avoid criminal charges. third problem with the system where we're only publishing the advertising and only publishing the article is that we don't value data, and so we lose it. And a study in biology found that we lose data at a rate of 17% a year, 17%. So if I'm a climate researcher and I'm looking at a particular species and I wanna look at that species now versus 10 versus 20 years ago, the likelihood that I can find that older data is really, really small. And that affects the questions that I can ask. That affects the kind of science that I can do, and that affects the, my ability to help that species survive. So we need to get over the system where we're only publishing the advertising, where we're only publishing the article. And the alternative is to publish article and the data and the code. And by code, I mean computer code. I mean the code that you throw the raw data into and it does an analysis and spits out a number that we can use and we can understand. I mean the code that actually creates the data in the first place that says that you say, I want to figure out what happens if I simulate X versus simulate Y. And in many research projects, that code is just as or more important than the data, and that needs to be made available too. The cool thing is if we get in a system where we can share the article and the data and the code, we can do a lot of really interesting things. The first is that we can build off of previously published results. And this is just a fundamental way that research happens. This happens all the time. So for example, if I see Sue Smith's study and I think it's really interesting and I could use it in my work, the first thing I'm gonna go out and do is take her published article and do it exactly as she did it to make sure I understand it, to make sure it's working right, to make sure everything's good, and then I'm gonna adapt it and adopt it for my research. But if I'm trying to do that just from her article alone, just from the advertisement, that's inefficient. That's frustrating. And that process could be a, certainly a lot smoother if I had access to the data and to the code. The second thing that this publication system is gonna allow us to do is catch those errors before they become big problems. Thomas Herndon, he found the errors in austerity because he had access to the data. And you can certainly imagine that Dietrich Stapel wouldn't have published 54 articles that were retracted if we had asked for his data early on. A third thing the system's gonna allow us to do, and this is where it gets really exciting, is that we're gonna have access to data we never had access to before. We can ask new questions, we can do new research. And one of the best examples of this comes from a project called Galaxy Zoo. And Galaxy Zoo took an open data set called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and that's a bunch of pictures of the universe. And two astronomers realized that those pictures had a lot of galaxies in them. And if we knew a little bit about the galaxies, we could answer some really important research questions. But to classify all those galaxies from the images is something that it would take a computer a really long time to do. So these astronomers decided to take the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data, to take what they know about galaxies, and put that information out to the public. And they say, help us classify galaxies. And pretty soon, the public had helped them classify 40 million galaxies. So that's a data set that didn't exist before. That's new questions they can ask about galaxies. But that's not the best part. During this process, they discovered new galaxies. And the little green galaxy I'm showing you here is called Haney's Vorwarp. 
It was discovered by a high school physics teacher in the Netherlands and named after her. And I just think that's so cool that we can do all these interesting things because we had access to data, because we put it in the hands of people who didn't have it before. And imagine if we can do that for all data. The fourth thing that a system where we publish article and data and code is gonna allow us to do is make better decisions. And this is something that affects everybody in the room because it means your economic policy makers are gonna make better decisions for you. It means your doctors are gonna make better decisions for you because they have all the information. And this isn't just theoretical. So another member of the Retraction Watch leaderboard list, he's actually just above Dietrich Stapel, is Joachim Bolt. And Joachim Bolt's claim to fame is that he studied a drug called hydroxyethyl starch. And hydroxyethyl starch is used in surgery to control blood flow. And it was adopted and used in millions of surgeries around the world, partly because Joachim Bolt was such a big proponent on it, because he published so widely. And I'm sure you know where this is going, that Joachim Bolt also made up a little bit of data, and hydroxyethyl starch is actually not better than alternative treatments. In fact, when they look at the family to which hydroxyethyl starch belongs, called colloids, out of 100 surgeries where they used colloids, four people were more likely to die using colloids as compared to alternative treatments. Four out of 100. So think of all the people in your family who have had surgery. Your siblings, your parents, your aunts and uncles, your grandparents. Maybe they didn't get prescribed hydroxyethyl starch. Maybe they did. Maybe they got lucky and nothing happened but it's a terribly tragic waste of human life to have put this drug into so many hospitals because we didn't ask Joachim Bolt for his data. So we need to get into a regime where we say data or it didn't happen. This is unacceptable anymore. And to do that, we need to do three things. The first thing is we're paying for a lot of research in this country, and that's really important. We need to keep paying for this research. But we can also say, you know, that's our tax money. Um, you should do this better. You should be more transparent. We want more accountability for where our money is going. And the good news is that some of this pressure is paying off. So some of our biggest funding agencies, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, are starting to put data policy into place that say researchers have to take care of their data better, they have to share it. But the problem is these policies aren't strong enough. They don't have enough teeth. And so we need to keep that pressure up to get to a point where this is standard. The second thing we have to do is just change the culture of research. Researchers are used to publishing articles. They're not used to sharing the data. They're very used to saying the data are mine. I'm going to hoard them. And that's been OK, but that's not OK anymore. We need access to the data. That's going to better our decision making. That's going to better our research. The final thing we need to do is build a better infrastructure. The reason why articles have been so successful in research is because we have systems to publish them and distribute them and find them and share them. And that infrastructure, it doesn't really exist for data. Or where it does, it's not very strong. So again, as taxpayers, we can say, this is important. We want to put money into this. We want a transparency and accountability. And we want to build that infrastructure so an average citizen can go out and say, I want to look at this data, and I can. I want to end by giving you an example of how successful this system can be if we publish articles and data together. And that example comes from the Human Genome Project. If you're familiar with the project, it started just before 1990 and ended just after 2000. And the goal was to map the human genome. And what you might know, not know about this project is that one of the principles of the project was that the data were, be to, were supposed to be made available as soon as anyone discovered a piece of the human genome. So by the end of the project, all that genome data, that was available for anybody to use. So a researcher went back and studied that data, and what they found, they compared it to similar data that was owned by a company and patented and proprietary. They found for every article published on the patented proprietary data, two articles were published on the human genome data. Twice as much research, twice as much innovation, twice as likely that we're gonna have some breakthrough that leads to saving human lives in a doctor's office. Imagine if we can take this and extend it to all research. Imagine the new questions we can ask. Imagine the new kind of answers we can find and the new discoveries we can make if we say data or it didn't happen. And because I believe in this so much, I'm sharing with you my data. Thank you. <laughs>